Hey guys, it's Tuesday. Here it is again, and it's the first Tuesday of the month. I do have to admit that that does make it my favorite kind of Tuesday, so I'm Alex. And I'm Amber. And this is another episode of True Crime and Chill. Okay, y'all, before we get started, we just want to drop a quick, uh, before we get started, we just want to drop a couple quick reminders. Yes. First, we want to remind you about our swag shop. On our website, truecrimeandchill.com, we have a swag store set up that has items with our podcast name, our thumbnail cover, and a few of the phrases you hear us say regularly. Yeah. Like, oh God, yeah. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> we also have stuff that says, hey guys, it's Tuesday, and the store is definitely worth a look. Yes, be sure to check it out at truecrimeandchill.com and tell us what you think. Yeah. We also want to take a moment and remind you that our season finale is coming up. Okay, so as you can see behind me, I have a murder board. Okay, The pink is all of the episodes that we have done so far, and this... Supernatural episode will actually make it our 19th episode. Oh my gosh. I can't believe that when we end when we end the season, we will be at 21 episodes. That's a 21. It's a good number. Time flies when you're having fun. Like, apparently. Apparently. (laughs) So our next episode will actually be a two-part that centers around a very big case that happened right where I like near I just moved to. Oh. How was your move, by the way? Long. Okay, so (laughs) those of you who do not know me or and are not friends with me on Facebook and stuff, which probably is a lot of you, um, I recently just moved from Colorado Springs to Clarksville, Tennessee. So yay me! So it actually helps because it does put me in the vicinity for some other cases that I wanted to explore. Um, all the towns that I can go, all the towns are actually, um, I think the furthest one is about 10 hours away, which honestly isn't that big of a deal. Like, it's still on the East Coast and everything. Plus, Salem, Massachusetts is a 10-hour drive from me. So, hey, spooky, spooky. <laughs> but no, I mean, right. But no, I mean, it was okay. Like, I, I definitely, it definitely was a change mm-hmm. um, for sure. Um, I'm not used to drinking my air. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, if some of you saw the face, the updates on the, on, on, on our, on our Instagram, actually, I actually posted a few of the updates of the road trip and it was pretty good. It was a two-day trip and stuff. And I mean, it wasn't too bad. It just was a very long drive. But I have this awesome room now that I like is bigger and nicer. And I'm able to set up a whole bunch of stuff for um, future cases and everything. So I'm super excited to see that. Throughout episodes for the second season, you'll actually see the wall behind me grow with like information on whatever case we're doing that week. Um, yeah. Like, I don't know if you guys can see it, but my board says case of the week, which is actually the name of our season finale. So if you caught that, good for you. But um, <laughs> for but, those um, watching our video on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, for those of you watching the video on YouTube, that's what it is. But no, it, it, was, it was really good. It was nice. Um, I mean, I met a few nice people here. Uh, someone who actually started listening to us before I moved here, which was nice. Um, yeah, like she, we met on Facebook in a mommy group on Facebook and she's here and we hang out all the time now. And she just started listening to me. So now whenever we meet up, I'll talk to her about cases. She's like, oh my gosh, I haven't listened to that one yet. I'm almost there. And like, she listens to me when she puts her kids down and stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, yes. I was like, cool. And then like, I have other friends who are like, who I've met who are like, gosh, your voice just sounds so familiar. And I'm like, well, I do have a true crime podcast. They're like, oh my God, I listen to that. That's where your voice sounds familiar. I was like, yeah. Um, I was actually just part of a, uh, a, a group for building your brand. I just went into business for myself, actually. So um, mm-hmm. I was doing this challenge, and it was like Tony Robbins and, and Dean Graziosi. And during that challenge, people were asking about, you know, oh, does anybody want to do a podcast? Does anybody have podcasts? And I was like, I do a true crime podcast. And people were like, what? That's amazing. So that was that was pretty fun. Yeah. Um, we we do it. Though. I mean, we don't do it because – I mean, we really like that we're doing this thing and people are listening, but we don't do it because of that. We actually do it just because we really we really enjoy it. So Let's just be real. We need an excuse to look up autopsy photos and the reason why we have murder on our Google 24-7. I mean, it's a thing that we do, and it's cool. Uh, it's fun. So anyway, I'm glad you made it safe, and I'm really excited to get into today's case. 
too. Okay. <laughs> so let's do this. All right. So I want to begin by mentioning that one of our goals here at True Crime and Chill is to do our best to remind people that victims of crimes are people, just like those who commit the crimes. Yes, they are all people too. And we honestly feel that everybody deserves to be remembered. That being said, this cold case is one that I really struggled to find any information about the victim herself. And truthfully, the only places I could really find information about her case was on boards concerning who, or rather what, people are convinced was behind this particular murder. Well, considering I have absolutely no clue what this case is about, and you literally just told me the theme of it today, (laughs) I am intrigued. Let's get started. All right. So in June of 1987, Sarah Saganitso was a housekeeper at the Flagstaff Medical Center in Arizona. She was 40 years old and a member of the Navajo tribe. She was working her first late shift, and it was said that she told people she was a little nervous. Well, it's understandable. I mean, starting a night shift at a, at a hospital, um, like, you know, there's lots of creepy stories about hospitals in general, let alone the night shift. Like, <laughs> Right. Absolutely. The next morning, her family became worried when she didn't come home. They went to the medical center, and that's when they found the body of a woman behind the medical center. Her face was so bruised, she was almost unrecognizable, but they knew that it was Sarah. Of course. Her torso had numerous stab wounds, and her left breast appeared to have been bitten off. For those of you not watching the video right now, ow. (laughs) Yeah. It was bitten. It was bitten off? Yeah, apparently. Yes. Uh, There was also a broken stick oddly left as well, uh, oddly left on her neck, as well as a clump of grass from a graveyard in the distance that was found near her car. What the hell? I I know. So, of course, that brings to light who or what would have done such a thing. Okay, let me guess. It was the husband. (laughs) If it was, this wouldn't be a great supernatural episode. Uh, No, the first person they looked at was her boyfriend. However, the investigation proved that the man in question was at a sweat lodge in Tuba City on the night of her murder. Of course he was out of town. How many murders have we heard of that? Oh my gosh, I know. Uh, When the bite marks were analyzed, the police believed that it was George Abney, a a former professor at Northern Arizona University. The prosecution offered testimony that the bite marks matched his teeth. Also, he had apparently been telling his friends about strange dreams he had been having where he was witnessing Sarah's murder. Dreams or dissociative episodes. (laughs) He is quoted as saying, quote, I was receiving prophecies from God, end quote. His defense lawyers had another story. The broken stick, the clump of grass. This was the work of a skinwalker. (laughs) Excuse me. Okay, I know what a skinwalker is because I've read into Native American legends, Mm -hmm. but what the hell? (laughs) That that's I'm I'm sorry. That is a giant leap. That is a giant leap. Uh, (laughs) Well, let me let me tell the listeners what a skinwalker is because I'm not sure what a lot a lot of them know what it is. Uh, It's said that there are some creatures so powerful and malicious that even speaking about them will make you their target. Sorry, I'm talking about them. Uh, And that's why so little is known about the skinwalkers. They are the legendary creatures of the Navajo Nation. And another name for them is the Yi Naldushi, which translates to he who walks on all fours. They seem to be witches who have gained the power to shapeshift, and they do this by wearing the skin of the animal they wish to take the form of. Uh, I did find a picture of a supposed skinwalker taken from a private CCTV camera outside someone's home in New Mexico. So, Alex, I want you to take a look at it. So, you know, I've seen, I have seen this photo, (laughs) like, roaming around the internet for years and stuff. And it's like, you know, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like. I don't know. Like half of me is like, oh yeah, I want to believe it. But then the other half of me just kind of looks at it and I'm like, it's it's totally Photoshopped. You can totally tell that's Photoshopped. Mm -hmm. Like you can totally tell, but at the same time, like I'm also not saying like, oh, like this legend isn't true because you know, I lived in Hawaii for two years and those legends are definitely true. So the entire island is haunted. So, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, skinwalkers aren't real. I'm just saying that's probably not what it looks like. 
Well, they say once the transformation is complete, the skinwalker will have the strengths and powers of the animal they're wearing the skin of. But this isn't just done for the fun of it. The intent of the skinwalkers is pure evil. They can use mind control on their victims to make them hurt others and themselves. One of their initiation rituals is to murder a family member. It is also said that if you make eye contact with the skinwalker, it will absorb your soul and steal your body. Yeah, because that doesn't seem far-fetched. <laughs> I agree. But to the Navajo, it's actually very real. So much, in fact, that in 1878, about 40 people were purged by tribe members who accused them of practicing malevolent witchcraft. Okay, so... I grew up in a predominantly Native American town. Mm -hmm. Okay. We both live there. Yeah, exactly. You still live there. So it's like obviously like growing up in a native in a predominantly Native American town, we had a lot of classes on Native American tribes and not just the ones that inhabited the Pacific Northwest. Like we did so like when I was younger, I used to be obsessed with, like, you know, the legends of, of like, the Native American tribes. Because, like, honestly, like, who wouldn't be? Like, some of them were just freaking really weird, but they were so cool mm-hmm. and stuff. And so, but it's like, I just, I don't get how any self-respecting defense can use that to try to get their, um, like, person off from murder. Well, like, I mean... Of course, That's almost as bad as saying, oh, it was a Wendigo. Right. Well, in court, nobody was buying the defense, and George was found guilty. Well, that's good. But I, I just, I don't know. I I don't get it. Um, like, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get how any, like, self-respect, like, I, I don't know. Like, I don't get how any self-respecting, like, defense uses that, though. I really don't. Like, oh, hey, it wasn't him. It was Wendigo. Schizophrenic. Say he has some kind of mental disorder, and I'm not saying that mental disorders make you kill people because that's not always the case and everything. But like, why, why use a Native American legend? Like, well, okay, so let's let's rewind for just a second because, like I said, in court, nobody was buying the defense, and George was found guilty. However, yeah, a year later, his case was reopened by Sarah's family. They believed he was truly innocent, and that, and then George was acquitted of all of his charges, and he apparently even became a close family friend of the Saganistos. Okay. So that's not too bad. Um, here's my thing. What do you okay. mean it's not too bad? The family was like, nah, he didn't do it. Nah. It was totally a skinwalker. And he was acquitted. Okay. So I get that the skinwalker takes like the form of somebody, mm-hmm. but like, do they like devour this person and then take the form or do they like, they just, they wear the skin and then they become that person and absorb their, their powers and abilities. That is so freaking weird. Okay. So, so typically, typically it's said that the skinwalkers take the form of coyotes. That's the one that they commonly take the place of, but a coyote, I'm sorry, is not big enough to bite off somebody's boob. Yeah, I mean, and if, like, well, and if, like, but it's not impossible that they could take the form of a human. It's definitely not impossible that they could. Like, I don't know. I just, I look into this. I really do. And I under, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the family forgave him and stuff, but at the same time, it's like. But the bite marks matched his teeth. (laughs) But, like, did they did they think it was a skinwalker before his defense even brought that up? Like, so it was it had to do with some of the evidence that was there, which starting with the the stick that was broken across her neck, uh, mm-hmm. and then the clump of dirt from the from the graveyard nearby. Those were the okay. signs to them. Okay. Uh, so, what really bothers me, though, I mean, overall, not not even half the stuff that we've talked about, but the fact was how deep I had to dig to get some of this information. The story only seems to appear on sites related to skinwalkers and not on any sort of news or archival websites or sources. Because so are we sure this case actually happened? I'm sorry? 
Are we sure this case actually happened? Or? Yes. Yes, it did. Uh, it happened in the late 80s, and there aren't a lot of news stories out there from it. However, it is listed on all of the Arizona cold case sites, and I found a few archive newspaper articles that were scanned in, and almost all of them discussed the likelihood of a skinwalker doing this. However, in one article I read, and I am quoting, Abney claimed he was having bizarre dreams about Saganisto's murder, which he told friends about. Under pressure, Abney confessed to have murdered the woman, but by Abney's own admission, he was having difficulty distinguishing between dreams and reality. Okay, so the dude murdered the chick and blamed it on the fact that he thought he was dreaming. It sounds like a dissociative episode. Like, it does. It sounds like a schizophrenic episode. Like, that's literally what this sounds like. Like, he was, he didn't realize that it was a dream, that it was real. He thought it was still a dream. Right. But he confessed that he did it because he was saying, well, I keep having dreams about the murder of this woman. And I feel like it's a sign from, you know, like it's because he was a devout Christian man. Right. And so uh, that's part of the reason that the prosecution started kind of looking at her boyfriend at first is because he was very deeply rooted, rooted in the Navajo and the Native American church. So Ugh. it would make sense. You know, it would, that happens. Well, but he would know then more about, you know, the the history behind the skinwalkers, in which case he would know to set up, you know, the stick and the the clump of grass and so on and so forth. Yeah. But like I said, but like, but like if, if, if he didn't know about anything about, and so like, obviously there were no computers back then. I mean, there were, but there weren't any computers that he could like, you know, hop on Google and research skinwalker articles. No. No, they were like DOS computers. It didn't work like that. Internet wasn't. Yeah. So like he would have to like actually go into libraries and stuff, which honestly wouldn't be too far fetched since he was a professor. Well, he also lived in Flagstaff and they have a very predominantly like they have a big Navajo population. So those cultures and those those, um, you know, those bits and pieces of it tend to seep into the everyday life of people living there because it's a huge tradition in the area. And I mean, don't get me wrong. It is honestly like, it's, it's awesome. Like if you actually dig into like the Navajo culture and the native American culture and everything, like their stuff is freaking awesome. Like, it's really interesting. It's, it's, but I'm, but you know, I'm a nerd like that. Like I love learning about new cultures and new religions and stuff like that. And like when I went to Hawaii, like when I lived in Hawaii for two years, like I literally read up on all the folklore and everything about that and stuff. And everybody was like, Oh no, that stuff's just a bunch of crap and everything. I'm like, no, it's not like, and even if it is like, and even if it wasn't real, like even if you're, they truly but like even yeah even if it really isn't real like they really believe it and it's up to us if we go and we visit somewhere it's up to us to be like hey we respect your sh- we respect your stuff yeah. so we're gonna like but like to to blatantly use this defense for a defense attorney to look at this case and be like this definitely was a skinwalker we're gonna say it was yeah. and to blatantly use this defense because i'm pretty sure the defense attorney was like you know what we're just gonna throw this out and we're gonna see if it works right like I don't think I don't think he was one of those guys that was like, oh, well, this is definitely um, this or that or whatever. Like I don't right. think they were one of those people that did that. They literally just threw it out and well, and like I said, work. prosecution was like, <laughs> no, you freaking did this. Uh, your bite, yeah. you know, your your teeth molds match the bite marks. However, that's actually considered junk science, so it doesn't always hold up in court. Yeah, and that's that's the unfortunate part because if they do it wrong, because teeth teeth marks aren't like um, fingerprints where everybody is where everybody's is unique. Like somebody could have like I mean, obviously, if you have like a definitive thing, like me, I have an extra tooth right here and everything. So like that would obviously leave a definitive imprint and stuff. So like they could be able to find it from that. But like or like if you have like three missing teeth in like a certain area and stuff, that could also do it. But I mean, I can see where that I see I can see where that com- where that's coming from, but I also see the other side of it, where like if there was nothing found at the scene that said like, oh, this is definitely a skinwalker, then I'd be more like, okay, this dude like blatantly murdered her in cold blood. Don't know why, and don't know why he ate her boo, but okay, like, well, and it's possible. I mean, in reality, what could have happened? And this is just theories because, like I said, I searched. A lot of places and there wasn't a lot of information not even about really who who sarah was right yeah like i couldn't find any information about 
her past, like who she was as a person. It was just, you know, she was found behind this hospital that she worked at murdered because this case has been cold for so long. That yeah. That's, that's all that was there. And it's listed on all of like Arizona's, like they have lists of all their cold cases because they recently started a cold case like uh, team to reopen yeah. the cases. And her case is on the list of, of stuff they're looking at. But it's possible because she was stabbed multiple times. I didn't get a definitive number, just that she was stabbed multiple times. And so it's possible that he stabbed her, left her out in the freaking desert, and then an animal started to eat her. But then why would his, but then why would, but then it would look more like animal teeth eating her. Because I'm sorry, but there is a difference between animal and human teeth. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Yeah. So, I mean, it's. I don't know. Like, I'm, that, like I, I'm sorry. Animal, animal that's teeth. Why I mean, these supernatural cases, like, that's so. I just want to put this out there. Like, this is the way that we like to do our supernatural cases. Like, we want to try and do, like, the true crime ones, right? The ones that actually have a crime in there somewhere, whether or not. Yes, and no. I mean, I found that, a few supernatural cases that I want to do that definitely are not true crime. And you're sitting there, like, I don't know how this could have happened because there's no humanly way possible. And I'm excited to debut those next But season. there's a crime. <laughs> associated with yeah right like this is a case that actually happened there is a woman who was stabbed and her left boob was bitten off and a man was accused and then the family of this woman was like actually no we don't think he did it we're pretty sure it was done by this skinwalker and so then he was acquitted of his crimes and then he became really good friends with her family i j- like, I mean, really, let's, let's take a step back and look at it like this and go, okay. I mean, clearly the family truly believed, truly believed that it was. I know, and if that, well, if that's what makes them feel better at night. Like, honestly, if this guy did not kill this woman, mm-hmm. but let's say he didn't. Okay, let's say he didn't and all that stuff. If we go by the Navajo legend of skinwalkers, then there would be no George. Right, because a skinwalker would have eaten him, or devoured him, or and it would be swallowed him. I don't know. I don't know. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It would literally be the skinwalker. So what are they doing? Just making friends with the skinwalker who like killed their kid? Right. Right. How is that not even creepier? Like, I, that's my. Like, let's just make friends with the there skinwalker. There's so many things with kid. it. That just makes no sense. None. None at all. I. This whole case is weird, especially because of the fact that, like, there isn't a lot of information on it. No. Which, don't get me wrong, we have dealt with cases where there isn't a lot of information on these yes. cases. Right. And this is the one disturbing. Case, like I said, there's, there's newspaper articles. It's on all the Arizona cold case lists. Like, it's a real case that happened. And most of the newspaper articles actually talk about how a skinwalker did this. That, yeah. It, it blew it just, my mind. But I don't know. I one thing know. I couldn't figure out was how he knew her, like how he would have picked her as a victim, whether or not, you know, it was, it was this George guy. Right? Because, like, she just started working at the hospital. Like, that was her first night, right? No. No, no, no. It was just her first night doing the night shift. Okay, so then he would have had to know, like, oh, she's she's doing the night shift and everything. Like, he would have had to know. Mm-hmm. Well, if it was know. her that was targeted. Exactly. Like, I mean, did he just pick some random person or did he, like. Right. Right. That's just it. Um, and then we're stuck here, like, wondering, like, because, like, now I'm, like, I'm not even going to lie. Like, now I'm confused. And people should really look up skinwalkers because that's. Oh, my God. Just don't do it at night. Don't do it at night. <laughs> Don't do it at night. No, there's some really creepy stuff out there. Yeah, the idea is that I mean they're they're witches, right? And yeah. the fact that I mean the Navajo people believed it enough where they purged forty people from their tribe. And when yeah. I say purged, I mean killed them. It was their own witch hunt. Yeah. In the late 1800s. Oh yeah, isn't that long ago? <laughs> so. Um, you know, it, it just, the fact that the family believed it so, so wholeheartedly though, to where mm-hmm. they reopened the case themselves and were like, this guy didn't do it. 
even though he he admitted. <clears throat> yeah, he even like sits there and says, "No, I did it, man." Right. He even sits there like, and says, "No, no I, I did it." Like, I, I've been I just don't trouble. know if I was dreaming it or if I actually did it. Like, right. his his excuse was, "I don't know if I was dreaming it or if I did it." Right. Right. So, I just, I, no, I know. I believe me. I'm right there with you. I mean, so overall, really, at the end. It comes down to, did George take advantage of the Navajos believed in the skinwalkers to get away with murder? Or was he in fact innocent? Uh, nonetheless, he was acquitted. Uh, did a guilty man go free or do murdering skinwalkers sometimes prowl Arizona? What do you think? Thank you for listening to True Crime and Chill. For more information, including case notes, photos, and sources, please visit our website at truecrimeandchill.com. You can also stay connected with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Look for new episodes from us each week on Tuesday.